think before I start introducing our panel, we're just going to show a public service announcement clip that uh, Bill has provided in. So with that, um, what I'd like to do is introduce our panel. Before you go, I just want to thank those who helped organize this. Um, Sarah Schulman, you played quite a critical role. Um, but Lynn Rosoff, Kathy Wolf, Sue Treadwell, and um, Stephanie Robox isn't here, but you know, thank you all. Um, so our panel tonight, let me just introduce. So Katie uh, is uh, a person who is in long-term recovery, and she'll be speaking about her experiences. Uh, Bill King is the York County Sheriff, and he'll be speaking to the uh, perspective from law enforcement. Uh, Patty Hymanson is a representative from York uh, in the uh, Maine uh, House of Representatives and ch uh, chairman of, Chair of uh, Health and Human Services and a physician. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kerry Nolte is a uh, uh, assistant professor of nursing uh, at UNH, uh, she is a family nurse practitioner, and she is one of the founding members of, remind me. The New Hampshire Harm Reduction Coalition. Thank you. So, with those introductions, what I want to do is let me just turn it over to Katie. We'll have each of our, our panelists you know, speak from their perspectives, and then we'll open up to Q&A. So, thanks. Katie, Thank over to you. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm a recovered alcoholic and drug addict. I grew up in Massachusetts, um, 30 years old. Um, I guess I'll tell you about like my childhood because I feel like that's the first question I always get when people are like, "Oh, you must have had it so hard. Like, what happened to you as a kid? You know, did you, you know, were was somebody mean to you? Did did you have something in your family go wrong?" And I loved that question before I got better because I loved to blame everything on like my parents and my family, but. In the reality, I grew up in an awesome home. I had loving parents. I had, you know, the best grandparents that took me all over the U.S. on vacations when I was younger. Um, I had everything. I never went without. Um, but there was like one thing 
inside of me that just never felt right. And I think that you'll hear that a lot when you speak to another, um, you know, drug user or someone that's better, and they just always say like, "I don't know, there's just something wrong. There's something wrong with me." And um, ever since I was little, I just I always had this like anxiety. You know, when I always say it was like I had a hole in my soul. And like the older I got, and the more that I tried to fill it with drugs, the bigger it got, and I just couldn't fill that anymore. Um, so. I was like a couple years old and my parents got divorced and you know my dad was always present in my life my mom was always there um, elementary school was great I had a ton of friends I played a ton of sports um, middle school was when things changed for me I met a girl who uh, her whole family was drug addicts and alcoholics like everyone from like her parents her step parents aunts uncles even her grandparents were all on something. Um, and I just remember thinking like, I was really attracted to this lifestyle that they had, right? And I didn't feel so bad when I was with them. Um, I felt like I belonged, like these people understood me for some crazy reason. Um, and I would go there and I would lie to my parents about what I was doing and I would go and the family would like buy us alcohol and they would buy us marijuana and we could get anything we wanted. and that was when, you know, my lying really started. I was like living a double life from when I was like, I don't know, how old was in year, sixth grade, like 10, 11, 12. Um, and so it just progressed from there, from sixth grade on. I stopped playing sports. Um, I started getting really nasty to my family. I started fighting with my mom all the time. Um, and then it wasn't until I got into high school was when the Oxycontin came around. I don't know if you guys remember that, that whole thing, but that's when it really started for me and I always thought because there was no addiction in my family that it, like it wasn't gonna happen to me you know like I can dabble like I can do this I can do that because it's not gonna happen to me um, and I had no experience either so I remember taking Oxycontin for the first time and thinking like there was like this neon sign went off that was like perfect you know like this is what this was a feeling that I was looking for you know it made me just feel like warm and fuzzy inside and I was actually like a better student. I was, I thought I was like a better friend. I, I was a better person because I was so calm. You know, like I would go to school and I would actually pay attention on this stuff. Um, I got better grades when I was on this stuff. Um, and that was like the beginning of my addiction though. And I feel like a lot of these things were true on the film because you decline so rapidly, I think, um, at the end of it. At the beginning of your using, it's hard to, I mean, it's really easy to cover it up because you don't look as bad, right? Like, you don't have all those signs and symptoms that are there because it's more manageable. Um, high school was okay. You know, I graduated barely. Um, and I remember people would say, like, well, what, what's your plan? What's your plan? And my goal was to, and it's funny because I'm 30 years old now, my goal was to keep living the way I was living until I was 30, and then that's when I was gonna settle down and get married, and come off drugs and drinking, and, you know, live my life. Um, and that stopped pretty quickly, I think. My first stint at rehab, I was 18. I was in high school. Um, I was stealing money from my family. I was stealing money from my mom's pocketbook, and she knew there was something going on, and. I actually admitted it to her. She came home one day from um, work early to like grab lunch and I was just in my bed, you know, all those signs and symptoms were there and she was like, what's wrong with you? Are you pregnant? And I was like, no. I was like, I'm addicted to drugs. And I just came out and said it and she was like, really? Well, what do you, what do you want me to do? Like, what can I do for you? And I remember saying to her, I don't feel good about myself. You know, I, I, and I said a list and all these like outside things that I wanted, like, you know, all these people in school, like, I just want a new car, I want my nails done, I want my hair done, like, I, I just wanted, I wanted, I wanted, like, I thought that I needed all these external things to make me feel better, and over the next year, I got all of those things right, and I still would be going back to using drugs. Um, I graduated high school, I ended up moving away, uh, my boyfriend at the time was in the military, so I moved down to Texas, and I thought that that was the best thing for me. My family was like, this is good for you. You just need to move out of the state because it's Massachusetts, like that's your problem. 
your friends are your problem, the state's a problem, and I moved away, and I brought that same person with me, you know, and I found those same drugs when I was down south. Um, I was there for like a year and a half, moved home. Uh, I was 19 at that time, and so from 19 until 23, when I actually um, quit using, I escalated from doing pills to injecting heroin in the matter of like six months. Um, and that's when it, it really changed for me in my life. Um, I was working for a family business at the time, and every single day I was coming into work late. Uh, it was very easy for me to steal money because actually it's funny. The, the job that I'm in now was the same job that I was doing back then. And it's like perfect for a drug addict, right? Like I'm doing accounting for four mm -hmm. big companies and all the cash that came in was just going into my pocket. And I was taking those invoices and I was getting rid of them. Um, and so that's how I was able to fund my addiction for so long. And people say that all the time, like, you were so young. Like, how, how did you afford to do that? I think I was doing... At the height of my addiction, when I was doing the Oxycontin pills, I was doing 10 80 milligram pills a day. Um, and that's a lot for someone that's like, you know, I was like 20 years old at the time and I'm like five feet tall. Um, but again, like I was able to steal money from my family. Uh, and that definitely kept me out of jail, I think, because a lot of people will just resort to robbing other people's like homes or whatever, uh, other people's pocketbooks. And so, um, from when I was 19 till I was 23, that's when it was really, really bad. I was in and out of um, detoxes. And every single time I would go to a detox, you know, they would say, they would always like have these groups where they would say, you know, draw your disease, you know, what does your disease look like? And then they'd say, you know, write a list of triggers. You know, there's obviously a reason. Everyone wanted to put their finger on like a reason why people were doing these things to themselves, why they were doing drugs and they were drinking alcohol. And I remember writing lists of like people, places, and things that um, I thought were the reasons why I felt the way I felt and the reasons why I was doing the things I was doing. And the only thing that wasn't on there was myself. Um, and I realized that until a couple years later. And, I would go to these detoxes and they would say, all right, well, let's try to diagnose you. You know, there's something wrong with you. Maybe you have bipolar, you know? And I'm like, okay, that sounds good. I'm up and down all the time, right? Um, and they would prescribe me bipolar medication. And what that would make me do, I'd go home and I would just sleep for like months on it. So like I couldn't hold a job. I would just lay in my bed and sleep and get up and smoke cigarettes. And that wasn't a life, right? Um, and eventually, I would just get so sick of feeling like that, I'd say, I'm just gonna go buy heroin, you know? Like, that's what makes me feel better. And then it was like a complete change, you know? My parents would see me stop this medication for this thing that they thought that I would have, and then I would like start doing heroin again, and I would just be like a normal person, you know? Like, I would just be able to get up and go to work and do certain things, and um, again, like, what is that gonna lead me to, though? That's gonna lead me down that path again where I'm eventually stealing from people. Um, and I need to go back to rehab, um, you know, go to detox again, and they're like, well, maybe you have an anxiety disorder. Maybe you have depression. And it was like three or four years of me going to these detoxes and people just trying to diagnose me with everything under the sun, as opposed to just looking at me and being like, you're a drug addict and you're an alcoholic, and there's only one way to fix you. Um, but it took a long time for me to like trial and error. And obviously I wanted to believe these doctors when they were telling me that like I had all these things because of course I wanted to have like an excuse to why I was hurting my family, right? Like why I would look my mom and my dad and my grandparents in the eye and be like, I don't want to be doing this, but I don't know how to stop. Um, and it was bizarre because people would say, well, what do you mean you don't know how to stop? Like here's this medication, like this is what's going to fix you. Um, and it never did uh, until I was 23. I went into the last program that I was ever in, um, and I loved that place dearly because I would do anything for anyone that came out of there, and I went there, and I remember for the first time, it was a place that you couldn't be on any medication. You know, My mom dropped me off, and I was sitting there across the table from this woman, Linda, who's awesome, and she slid a notebook across the table, um, in a book, and she said, you know, we don't screw around here. You know, you're gonna get better. And I was like, okay, I'm like a 
lot of people have told me that before, but what do you mean? And she's like, went through all my stuff, and she's like, you want any medication? And I'm like, nope. And she was like, okay, perfect. You, you might actually have a shot at getting better. And I was just like, really? And she was like, yep. So went up to my room, went to sleep, woke up the next day, and it was like on. You know, it was like, all right. I sat in these groups for hours, and then all of a sudden I was just writing for days on end. And I was at a place called um, the Plymouth House up in New Hampshire, and it is a, it's classified as a 12-step spiritual retreat. And it's the only thing that I've ever seen work for people that got off medication and were able to like live a successful life. Um, I was there for a month. And what that entailed was a rigorous step process, which was like, you know, you sit down, they take you through this book, and they're like, okay, this is why you have what you have. Um, you know, and I always wanted an answer to like, well, why am I hurting my family? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing that? And it wasn't until someone pointed out to me and said, you're doing these things just because you like the way it makes you feel. And I was like, oh, wow. You, you're so right, you know, and, and it's really hard for like a parent to swallow that and be like, my kid's doing these things because they just want to feel a certain way, and it's like, yeah, you know, once you put those in your system and you like the effect that it produces, like, you're not going to stop, you know, and you just want to keep feeling like that, whether it's like stealing from someone or stealing from your job. Um, so I was there for a little while, and it was a long process of like just digging deep, and they said, you know, make a list of people, places, and things, and I was like, oh no, you gotta do that again? And they were like, no, just write it down. I think I had 300 people, places, and things in this notebook, right? And then they said, you know, the next part was why? Why do you resent all these things? And then the last part of it was like turning all these resentments that I had around on myself. Mm -hmm. So they were like, how are you selfish? How are you dishonest? How are you self-seeking? And what are you afraid of? And those four major questions to ask yourself on any of these resentments were like the most eye-opening thing because then I started realizing I was like, wow, you know, I feel the way I feel inside because I have all like I had this like my brain was so warped on like what life was really supposed to be about. Um, I was just very selfish and self-centered like to the core, and like of course I was just going to keep using all these outside things to try to make myself feel better because. That's what drug addicts do. Um, but so yeah, I, I was at that place for a month, and then it was just like a game where it was like, okay, well, what do I do next? What do I do next? And they were like, well, go to sober living next. You know, you can't go home. You know, and I'm like, why do I have to go to sober living? And they said, you know, if you go there, you're not going to depend on your family anymore. You're going to go someplace, and you know, you're going to get an extension of what we're doing. So. I went to sober living for a little while, and you know, eventually I made my way back home. Um, my mom let me move back in. I ended up going back to my job, and um, what's different about, like he was asking me if I was on medication, and I was like, what did you call it? M-A-T. M-A-T, and I was like, what's that? <laughs> I had no idea, but a lot of people, I think, are told to go on like the Suboxone clinic or the methadone clinic or like go on these things that every single time I was on those, I was like so messed up and I couldn't even function. Um, and all those things do is like lead you back into the same cycle. You know, it's like, why wouldn't you want to come off of everything and give it a try? And I remember too, what they were saying in the rehab I was in, they were like, just give it a try. You know, if you're still absolutely insane when you are in the step process, like this 12 step process, like a year down the road, of course you can go get evaluated by a psychiatrist and see like if there's something really going on up there. And it was crazy, like I was diagnosed with all these things and I don't have any of that. Like I just needed a spiritual solution to life and people were like, oh, what do you mean? Like spiritual solution, and that's kind of weird. Like do you go to church now? And I'm like, no, not really. Um, what my life looks like now is I help a ton of women in early recovery. Um, my husband back there is in recovery too. Um, we had met very early on and I don't even think we even dated until I think I was like six years like in. Um, but yeah, I mean, what it looks like now is I help other women. Um, meditation, you know, um, just anything to give back is, is great too. I mean. 
once someone gets this, I really think they need to help other people with it because that's like how the world goes around, right? Like I sponsor women, I have a sponsor, and if you don't give what you have, like you're not gonna be able to keep it, and that's just like what I live by. I think that if I stopped helping people, I would eventually just like forget where I came from and just go down that same path that I was in before. So I don't know. You guys can ask me questions at the end, but I think that's like thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Bill, who are you? I have to follow her. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the other day, when I was going to work, we had a, uh, a call. A two-year-old child was found, found by a couple of folks. Uh, that's close enough, isn't it, folks? Yeah, yeah that works. Right. Yes. Was found by some people, and they called the police. They said, gee, we don't know who this child is. I apologize for the videographer. <laughs> Getting a little close. But, uh, but we, you know, I raced up there, and the deputies were all knocking on doors and finding out, um, gee, you know, where, where is this child? And we eventually found, you know, found where the child belonged. The child had gotten out from the, uh, it was a very adventurous child, got out from a doggy door. <laughs> but, but afterward, we, we kind of thought, I mean, because every one of those deputies was frantic, banging on doors. And I said, guys, what did you think? What, what did everybody think? What, what, what the heck is a two-year-old child doing out at 6.30 in the morning? And every one of my guys says, well, we thought the parents were overdosed. We thought the parents were dead. I mean, that's what it's come to. Just tonight, when the chief and I were coming, to, coming here, we encountered a crash. And it was a well, woman was driving on this road, and I'm not making any determinations, but it appeared that she nodded off and she ventured over into another lane and she hit a tractor trailer. Oof. It's amazing that she's not dead. But her ear was ripped, ripped. Mm -hmm. And I said to Tom, the chief afterward, I said, she's got to be on something. Because that is painful as heck. He said, well, the, dri the tractor trailer driver did say that she drifted over into his lane. And you know, now again, the investigation's not done. We don't have any, any toxology to, to, to make any real comments. But it just, when we talk about what is the effect on everybody, this, this, it, it, it affects everybody. What's the magnitude in York County? <clears throat> well, I'm telling you, it's filling up our jails. At, at any given time, you know, and some people have been to our jails, I mean, uh, Michelle and uh, the lady next to her that just got arrested, I forgot her name, but anyway, <laughs> the, uh, you know, <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it, it's filling up our jails. At any given time, you know, we, we've so got, you know, eight to ten people detoxing. I mean, and this has just become very, very, it's been normal business. And um, about a year and a half ago, I had a, uh, actually be two years ago now, a woman, a girl from uh, Clark University was doing a student. She said, I need to do uh, something for uh, extracurricular activity or something. She said, so summertime, she said, well, what can I do? And, you know, because she wanted to do something more, you know, with the inmates, but I said, well, I really can't have you doing, you know, mental health type stuff, but, I said, but you can do a survey for me, and she did a survey. Uh, and I said, because I want to know is how many people are incarcerated, the York County Jail holds 296 people, and I think at the time we had probably close to 250 or 260. How many people here are here for some type of a drug-connected thing? And of all the volunteers that want to volunteer and talk with the, uh, with, with the student, it was literally like 98% of the people there were there for some drug connected. Now, they might have been there for theft, but they admitted, well, it was drug fueled. So it's clearly, it's, it's affecting all of us. And it's, you know, it's killing our young people. Everybody is affected. And I, I'm just going to race down to the 418 deaths in 2017. This is just unconscionable that we have more than one a day in the state of Maine. So how, how, how does it, you know, heroin, heroin addiction is here, but, but how does it happen? How does it start? It's very clear that it starts with prescription medication. That's why, Katie, that was, that was a great conversation that you had. It starts with prescription medication. And I, I do have a couple of uh, handouts. I, I want to hand out, this is an article I wrote for um, Sheriff's Magazine that talks about, actually talks just about that, what the um, uh, effect of heroin abuse, drug abuse is in the, in the county. And we also, when we talk about uh, prescription medication abuse, 
Does anybody here know what the drug take back is? <coughs> we do the drug take back. Now, the, the feds, the, the Drug Enforcement Administration started the drug take back. And then they, after seven years, they discontinued it. Well, the Maine Sheriff's Association continued the drug take back. And now we're in our ninth year, and when we began, we got like 20,000 pounds in New York County of unused or unwanted medication. And guess what we got last time? At the last drug take back, 21,000 pounds. We're always hovering. We're not reducing the amount of, of unused or unwanted or expired medication. And this is another article I, I wrote about it. it, it again, it, it's just it's a, uh, it's a continuing thing that we have um, um, just a, a lot of uh, marijuana around. I, I'm sorry, we have a lot of uh, unused uh, uh, medication around. And oftentimes, any cop will tell you that and it used to be that a burglary would happen and people would bypass electronics, bypass the television, but they would hit the, uh, the medicine cabinet and they would empty out that. So, you know, not, so we've had, and Maine has experienced an 84% increase in prescription drug overdoses in the last five years. 93% of our addicts do not realize they were addicted or think that they need help. I found Katie's talk really good because I was very interested in the transition from crushing up a few pills and you know snorting it to actually taking a needle and putting it in your arm. That to me is a, a huge transition and I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you Katie but what I'm told is most of the people have help. Somebody helps them put the needle in the arm and this is this is why when we talk, I mean I have a Prior to being the sheriff of York County, I was a federal agent, and I did federal drug work. And most of my drug work back in when I was uh, younger in my federal career was with cocaine. And cocaine dealers are bad guys, but they're nothing compared to these heroin dealers because they are you know, basically they're killers, and they go around and they destroy lives. And that's one of the things what people have told me in jail. I asked them, "How did you transition?" Oh, somebody helped me. They helped me put the needle in my arm. To me, I just think that's, that's uh, it, it's huge. So we started with prescription drug medication. Then it got expensive, right? And then, and then what happened was Purdue Pharma, they, you know, under a lot of pressure, they changed the coating of the Oxycontin. They changed the so it was rubberized. So now you couldn't crush it up so much and snort it and get that euphoric feeling because it was rubberized. And plus there was a lot of that, Oxycontin was being diverted, I mean, you, and you could sell it for 60 bucks a pill. So people would go around, go go doctor shopping, and get all kinds of get all kinds of oxycontin and, and sell it and make a decent living. Um, but then we started the drug prescription monitoring program, which was very very successful. DEA did that so that if uh, 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 I was going to say Dean Ruckerson, I'm sorry, Representative. <laughs> but, so let's just say if Dean went to one pharmacy or went to one doctor and he got prescribed that, he couldn't go to the next one because the doctor would look it up and say, geez, Dean, you already got it, you know, two weeks ago. What's going on? And they know how much they prescribe. So then we were able to put a stop to that. Um, so it really put the pressure on prescription drugs. And that's why, and then prescription, uh, prescription uh, medication got very, very high. And that opened up a huge market because somebody that was addicted to an opioid was still addicted even though it was expensive. So then we went, they went to heroin, and heroin was much cheaper, it came from out of state, people were able to get it, and um, they satisfied that need. Heroin has now been replaced, and you've heard about deaths, you've heard about a lot of heroin deaths. Well, ladies and gentlemen, heroin's not killing people anymore, it's fentanyl. Fentanyl is basically, it's a, it's a, um, it's a manufacturer, synthetic opioid that's manufactured in China in some little laboratory, and it's actually responsible for 58% of main deaths last year. And let me just show you one quick thing. This is all it takes. Wow. Now, we took, we take that much heroin, that much fentanyl, and then we all said, oh, we were all so happy. Carfentanil, the elephant tranquilizer. It's not here in Maine. It's not here in Maine. And about six months ago, I was off to do another one of these talks, 
And someone, and I always said, well, you know, cough and all, thank goodness we don't have it here in Maine. And you know something? We did have an overdose death in Parsonsfield on cough and all. And I, I hate to tell you that we've had now two since. Wow. So, uh, I, I, find, I did find another article I, that I, uh, Dr. Dillahunt wrote it out. It talks about uh, fentanyl being the, um, uh, really the, num the number one killer right now. Um, I think, I, how, we're going, how we're going to solve this, I, I, I really think that is through these types of forums, and I really think it's through, I, I was very interested in, in Katie's story, because I, she kind of, I, I do think that I, I like to see people getting better and establishing natural supports, you know, through whether it's a faith-based program or through, you know, gaining some natural supports. But MAT, you know, medication-assisted treatment is also, it's, it's come up with, with great strides. Um, you know, perhaps when we, uh, uh, I don't know, with Medicaid expansion, would, would that hopefully get somebody some, some viv Vivitrol or some methadone or some Suboxone. <coughs> but I do want to just kind of to address this need so that, that they can live productive lives and that and we can all, I think, live a little safer with, um, without that uh, addiction fueling people. Again, we're going to be here for questions, so I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll close <coughs> out here. <coughs> Thank, Thank you. you. So next I'll have uh, Kerry uh, from the healthcare perspective and tell us about the program here in Boston. So while we're doing that transition, Katie, you, you were nodding when Bill mentioned that people tell you how to do or put that needle in the first oh, yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking that and I was like, my child, one of my childhood best friends was the one that, it was, it's weird. I feel like a lot of people make the transition too because after sniffing something for so long, your nose actually starts to get blocked. Like you feel like you have a cold constantly. So that's why people start injecting heroin because they can't get enough of the stuff that they need up their nose anymore because it's so blocked. Like you constantly feel like, you know when you you have like a, a cold and you like can't blow your nose because it's just like stuck. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. That's what your nose feels like constantly. So like, what do you get? obviously you need to go to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And it was one of my friends that was like, well I've been doing this for a while and I've been lying to you about it. So let me just show you. And I was like, all right. And then that was it. You know, right. that was right. it. And then I think of it now. I'm like, she was that one friend who tried methadone. She was on it for six years. And she actually is the only person I know to ever come off of it and was like, I, I don't even remember my life for the last six years. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so clear-headed now. Like, yeah. she didn't even know if she wanted to be, like, married and have kids anymore. It was, like, that <laughs> profound. Like, she was like, I feel like a different person. So. Okay, okay Carrie. <laughs> Thanks. So um, my work and my research is around harm reduction. Um, harm reduction, the most common intervention that people think about is needle exchange or syringe service programs, but it's really a broad approach to care. And so both in my work as a family nurse practitioner, um, where I now just work part-time at Families First, um, but also in educating nurse practitioners, sort of talk about meeting people where they're at. And so principles of harm reduction are all good, positive collaboration, respect, acceptance, compassion, empowerment, all things we want and all things that we expect for ourselves in the healthcare that we receive and often are things that people who use drugs don't receive. And so I look at healthcare experience, I look at how people can better engage, because often when we have a person looking to get, to connect with recovery services, to get a health issue addressed, often they have to actually overcome the trauma first of really terrible experiences and being treated very poorly in healthcare. And so I work on kind of positive approaches. So how I sort of frame some of the, these notes or my thoughts, um, I'm a professor, so PowerPoints are my security blanket, I just have to have one, um, is really you know, around kind of what I do with work for healthcare providers, but also what we can all do. So um, one, one step in reducing harms is just changing the language that we use. So thinking first about person-centered language. So if you had a medical diagnosis, if you were, if you were diagnosed with diabetes, and I as a healthcare provider 
was coming in and was like, oh, I got a diabetic in room two, I got to see. Um, that's very different than connecting with the person. And so often we hear terms like addict, um, and it sounds very final. So there's quite a bit of research around communication and how just if we talk about a person who uses drugs, um, that that changes other people's approaches. So if I'm giving a report off to someone about um, a client coming in and I talk about an addict or I talk about how they had a relapse, that often leads them to provide different care and, and associate that with them being responsible for what it, we know is a biochemical process. So good term, terminology to use is person with a substance use disorder, person in recovery, and even if they, they were um, able to be sober to, and then started using, talking about that as a setback. So relapse is, is really viewed as this final term of like, it's not, you have just taken a huge step back, you're just a drug user again. Um, and so that's one thing that we can all do when we have conversations, and that alone may actually shape how we come up with strategies and look more um, to connect people in a positive way. So we know that there's a continuum of substance use. So there are people who use, um, who use needles, who inject heroin once, once in a while, um, do it a couple times and don't get into what we stereotypically think of as chaotic drug use. Using every day, um, making, um, you know, putting their safety at risk within their use. And so if similarly, you know, with thinking through how we address this and how we think about this, how we use our language, it's really important to think about um, a, this is a chronic disease continuum. So I, I always go back to, to diabetes, but if we have a person who we're treating for diabetes and their blood sugar numbers start to go up or start to go down, we talk to them about what's going on. We talk to them about how those numbers are changing, um, but we don't put them into categories. Um, we, don't, we try to be proactive in problem solving around how they can get those numbers better. And so similarly, you know, that's what we should do in, in care of people who use drugs. So thinking about it like a chronic health issue makes us know that people have steps up, steps down, and sometimes those, those are both successes and failures, and that it, it doesn't mean that they're final, and we have to stop thinking about that. So relapse is a final term. Um, it, some people are happy in decreasing their use um, and making changes to be safer. Um, and that can be, and we have to kind of positively talk about those successes. So one of those successes is reducing risk by using <coughs> sterile needles. Um, and so in, in the work I do around needle exchange, that's one of the, the simplest goals that can clearly save our system money can prevent, health con can prevent negative health consequences. And so it becomes really important and that self-efficacy in setting goals and achieving goals is what I think can help people to kind of take those steps down and to get to a point where, um, where they can be in recovery. So in our current healthcare system, we know that we don't do a great job of managing addiction. Um, and the reason for that is that we think that treatment is this solution that gets people engaged. So we think that after someone gets treatment that they have these great outcomes where they're able to engage in the community, they're able to be positive. And although that reality happens for people, um, that isn't the common reality. And we, blame, we put treatment as the focus. So there's a big movement to recovery-oriented systems of care in which we think about all of these assets and all of these options that people have and treatment as one of those. And so with all of these things that contribute to substance use and can be positive or negative, we have faith, work or school, social support, belonging, family, housing, peer support, which do you think is the most predictive of someone's success in recovery? Here's Peer support, not not based in this model, but that's a super critical. Family. What? Family. Not family either. Housing. Housing. 
So stable housing is one of the one of the greatest factors, and all of these are related. But for some people, thinking about how they can connect on these other levels, so as opposed to recommending someone get into treatment, and that is clearly the only solution, how can they connect and how can they engage within the community in a positive way? So how can we welcome that person into something that you don't, maybe you don't have, you don't think they'd be engaged in? How do we get them here? How do we get them involved in policy? You know, any of those things can be beneficial. And so currently, um, where housing is one of the biggest focuses of this, we know that our housing policies don't mirror this approach. So usually public housing has um, rules around being in sobriety, being in active treatment, being in recovery, whatever they are, in order to get housing. But we know that if people get housing first, that actually gets them into into recovery, and that's where the success is. It also, often in public housing, provides a lot of these other things of social support and connection and being around others. So there's a lot of discussion in the recovery community around what the best treatment is. And if we had one treatment that worked for everyone, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. We wouldn't be talking about more than a death a day um, from overdose. And so there's a lot of guidelines. I don't expect you to be able to, to read, all, read this slide, but just to, just to give you kind of an idea of all of the programs available. So, it's, so in primary care, primary care is, tries to take on more of substance use treatment. And one of those interventions is medication-assisted therapy, which was mentioned and I'll talk a little more about. And so some people do really well with their primary care provider, supporting them through this process with behavioral health counseling. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's medically managed intensive, like inpatient stay, where they're in um, treatment for an extended period of time, sometimes up to, um, up, up to 30 days or even longer, in which they receive medications, they manage complex psychiatric care that may be associated, but, but when we have an experience or we hear someone um, talk about you know, talk about their son, daughter, or what they need, that we need to make sure that we don't have one set view of what it is, that there's multiple pathways to recovery, and it's not just a single one-size-fits-all approach. So across, um, across all of these different types of treatments, um, medication-assisted therapy is an option. So not a good fit for everyone, um, but can be offered. So medication-assisted therapy, um, there's three primary options. One is methadone, which is an opioid maintenance dosing where they're receiving a dose. Another is suboxone, um, which is an opioid and also has um, an opioid receptor blocker. So if they're on suboxone um, and were to use heroin or something else, they wouldn't get the same feeling from it and may feel sick. Another one is um, Vivitrol, which is just that blocker alone. So all of this is so dependent on the person, on what they need, and the client's goals and, and what they want to achieve helps to guide that. Um, so some people do great in, um, in counseling alone, some people do great with medication alone, um, and we have to just think about that and really individualize care for people. So here's a morbid comic, just to, you know, as a, as a little break, but more evidence of a healthcare system in crisis. So you have three at graves at um, grave sites, and good news fell, a hospital bed just opened up. Um, but it's a little too late for Phil. So what happens with me in primary care and trying to get people into care and support and treatment um, is often really challenging. So if people are really acute, and they need to get into a hospital, like supervised setting. Um, we often, and I, I don't, you know, do this on paper, but we often have to ask them to lie. So we ask them to, we tell them to show up at the ER and tell them they're suicidal. And they're not suicidal, but that's the only way that we can access treatment. So if you try to put that parity or move that to any other health disorder. Um, we would not accept that, that you would have to falsify information in order to get the care you need. So also, you know, 
we so if people want to are maybe stable they're they want to get into treatment but they don't need to have supervised inpatient in the hospital treatment immediately then um, they call and they call lots of centers so they call 20 centers so just thinking about your morning this morning if you suddenly had to call 20 different treatment centers, ask them about their admission requirements, the paperwork they need, what their wait list looks like, when they have a bed, how often they have a bed, and then in what that, insurance they take. what insurance they take, whether they take your insurance, which plan you have, and then within that, then in order to show that you're really motivated to get into treatment, then you have to call every day and you have to ask if they have a bed and ask if they're available. And then if they do suddenly have a bed, you have to blow your day, get a ride, go to the health center, get me to write to scribble on a note that you don't have an infectious disease. And then in depending on the program, I have to write your prescription. Someone else has to write your, the, the barriers are endless. If we, if you had chest pain and you went to the hospital, and they said, we don't have a bed for you, or the cath lab isn't open, we would never accept that as a society. But right now, we've been accepting this for way too long around substance use. And so those opportunities, when people are have to go jump through all those hoops, not get the care they need, those become setbacks for people. And that brings them off into their coping mechanism, which is many times drugs. And so the system itself actually pushes people to seek what they know and seek where they have security. And so part of my kind of message or my hope for everyone is that we all stop tolerating the, the system as it is and demand more um, clear you know, parity for medical care and for substance use care because it is medical care. So the, I'll talk a little bit about certain service programs now. So um, I, start, I was a founding member of the New Hampshire Harm Reduction Coalition, and so we started a program in the Seacoast area. We've been providing service in Dover and Rochester, and we'll be expanding to Portsmouth and Hampton, Seabrook, hopefully soon in the future. So everyone's question is always, does not that give permission to use? So people who are using drugs don't need permission to use drugs. And if you told me that there were clean needles available for me today, that doesn't mean that I'm suddenly more incentivized to use drugs for some reason. So what we do know is the financial argument for syringe service is really clear. For every dollar spent in syringe service programs, it's a three to seven fold um, savings in the health system, three dollars to seven dollars. And, and why? Okay, so the biggest reason is infection. So we know that our hospitals are overcrowded and burdened with people who have infections related to injecting. And we also know that our rates of overdose um, are also sky high in our area. And so syringe service programs connect around overdose prevention. And a lot of that is education. Although we do provide Narcan, an antidote um, used in overdoses, we also talk about safer use. So we talk about not, when you get a new supply of drugs, not injecting all of that, making sure that you know that once you've been in jail and you're coming out, that's one of the biggest risk times for overdose because people go to use what they were using before and don't have quite the same tolerance. So we, in this, this work and all of this evidence is available on the Center for Disease so we also know that syringe service programs in communities that they're in reduce the incidence of accidental needle sticks by about two-thirds. The most likely people to be stuck by needles um, that have been used are police officers. And so what we do is we engage a community of people who use drugs in order to get them vested in protecting their health and safety in the community. So recently where we have probably our biggest outreach in the Rochester area, we had been asked to join the Earth Day cleanup um, because people were really concerned that they were going to be finding syringes and so we were there to help support and um, collect them safely. And we didn't find one on a cleanup day in a place where they were sort of expected to be. Now I can't say we can take all the credit for that, um, but it's also sort of a discrepancy in the fear around finding syringes and then the actual um, you know, not finding any, which was a great success. So why do we get so many infections? So 
in this area, we did a study, we did interviews with people who inject drugs, and we heard that people were reusing needles about 100 times, which is baffling. How that's even possible, I don't know. But so under a microscope, you see a sharp bevel of a needle. And then after one use, you see that there's nicks and cuts. And then after six uses, you see that that thing is just going to tear up your veins. So a lot of the infections and uh, that like um, heart infections, like endocarditis, that are associated with injecting come because of this, because we're tearing up um, the, the veins and getting in the way of um, and, and introducing bacteria through that. So we work really, so in Maine, um, the syringe service program laws are a little different than in New Hampshire. Um, there aren't currently any syringe service programs right in this area. I think, not knowing Maine geography well, the closest one would be Portland. Um, and um, there's also a bit of restriction in um, Maine that New Hampshire doesn't have, and that is a one-for-one -one exchange. And so the evidence is pretty clear that you, what, what we try to do is meet people where they're at. We ask them what they need. And so our ideal is that people are using a sterile syringe every time, once every time that they inject. And we then give them big sharps containers to collect those used syringes. And so one of, what happens with a one-to-one -one exchange is often that how do you get that big canister back um, and so often there's lapses, and so because of that, people then store them in their pockets, store them places that are easily accessible because they can't get one syringe for every use. Um, and so that is a restriction that's currently in the, in the main legislature, which is um, clearly not the CDC recommended best practice. So there, uh, we got legislation passed, we're very new in last year in New Hampshire, and like I said, we're um, hand up health services, will be in um, Portsmouth and very soon. So we, we base on an outreach model. We don't have a brick and mortar center set up. Um, we connect with people, we have a card, they have our number, they can text us, they can call us, we get volunteers out to them. Our volunteers are primarily healthcare um, providers, nurses, um, physicians, nurse practitioners, um, and people in recovery. And so, not only do our volunteers connect with people, talk about goal setting, but they also can connect them to all those services that they work in in their paid life. Um, we currently provide overdose prevention, give out Narcan, um, sterile supplies, education, and um, refer to different services like substance use treatment. Um, and one of the things that in, in our kind of needs assessment or understanding, we always ask people like, what do you need? What do you, what, what is it that is, you know, that is kind of helping, preventing you from being as safe as you can be? And one of the common things, as you saw in the video, is cigarette, um, using cut up cigarette filters in order to filter the drug when they're pulling it up. And um, as you know, there's a lot of junk in cigarettes and a lot of junk in the filters. And so um, a lot of the infections that we know come from in, um, through injecting um, actually come from some of those particles and the, the damage done by those particles in the bloodstream for a long period of time isn't really known, but there may be an association with some, some cancers later in life. So what the community said they needed was cottons. So cottons that are safer to pull the drug through and that that was their biggest challenge to being safe. There's also been a lot of identity in our program around having our big sharps containers that they can return to them. So people are psyched to bring them back. We are like ready to dance when people bring them back. But what happened at first when people are storing and reusing their needles a hundred times is that in our first quarter, our return rate on syringes was like 15%, which doesn't sound good. So that means for every hundred we're giving out, we're getting 15 back. And then for our next quarter, it was 35%. And then in our most recent data, it's 60%. So some of that engagement, knowing that we're gonna keep showing up, knowing that we're gonna keep having supplies is what gets the return. And then we talk to the community about like, hey, we gotta get more back, how can you help us? And you even have people engaging in camp areas that they know people use and doing cleanups there and pickups there. So we do training on picking um, other people's needles up safely. And so it's really a community-driven initiative. 
So the last, or uh, second to last thing um, is just having Narcan, talking about Narcan, having it available. The Surgeon General just had a great statement that pretty much everyone needs it. We have some here. Um, it, oh, for, and um, there's different community-based trainings that can be done, but any of us may witness an overdose, but especially if you have someone near and dear or connected to you, um, make sure that you have it, make sure you talk about it. In providing Narcan to someone, or as in, you know, I really want to make sure you're safe, right there is a great conversation about general compassion. So the last thing uh, is really just about having conversations. So talking about it here, talking about it with friends and family, not saying like, oh, Diane's son, you know, I know he's been using drugs, so I don't want to talk to her about that. Talk about that. Learn from them what the struggles are about getting into treatment, what hoops have to be jumped through, so that you can then be an advocate. Because because Diane has to really worry about taking care of her son. And so you can worry about some of those bigger picture things of getting, getting the care mechanisms that people need. So having curiosity to learn about substance use. Like we talked about, there's not one pathway. Um, it's not, you know, we know that adverse childhood events in early childhood are associated with substance use, but there is a different reality for each person. And just understanding those different realities and kind of what led to that is what can ha lead to some um, supportive conversations. So who can you connect to? Who can you have conversations with? Anyone is the first thing. Um, syringe service programs is another. Um, and understanding that work and understand what we're seeing and understanding how we're, how actually asking people what they need and giving them what they need helps them engage in the system. And also legislators around substance use treatment and the needs that we have. Um, and some of the syringe service reform I would push you to advocate for in, um, in Maine, which I know has been a long, ongoing conversation. Um, but there's plenty of data to support why that's important. So um, these are just kind of a summary of many of the things. And I'm sorry that I took up too much time. Um, but thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect, perfect segue to legislation. So, Patty? <laughs> I'm going to give you just a basic five minutes, a couple minutes more on, on the structure of what I have done, what I'm doing, what the state legislature is doing. So um, I'm a state legislature, leg legislator, it's my sec end of my second term. I'm a physician, I'm a neurologist. I've been in private practice here as Dr. Locuratolo for 30 years. Closed my practice three years ago ran for office, and I'm now chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee, where most of this comes to. Um, so it's been a steep learning curve for me about how the legislature works and what's possible in a very contentious legislature. Um, contentious because we have a governor who really does not believe that anyone should be helped. And he said that in a number of different ways, a number of occasions, um, as much as let them die. Um, so when you're facing some a governor who's going to veto everything with that intention, then it's hard to move things forward. But let me tell you what we have done. I come from a background, first of all. Um, I trained in New York City and in Boston during the heroin epidemic of the 1980s when uh, HIV just came up. We had no idea what it was. I worked in public hospitals. People were coming in with white tongues and dying two weeks later. And um, so, um, so that was my introduction to um, opiates and all drugs of all sorts, but opiates and opiate addiction. Um, as a neurologist, I um, treated pain, chronic pain, and I was part of that idea that narcotics to treat pain really was a whole different subset for, from um, street addiction to narcotics. Um, so that's a whole other thing I could talk about. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you things that I know about um, deeply, and if you're interested in them, ask me a question about them. But I'm not going to stay on any, any topic as I move through this. Um, so, um, so, uh, so here I am in the legislature. What's happened in Maine? Um, well, um, in uh, 2015, the governor, um, the uh, uh, federal um, Judge Delahanty and, um, and our Attorney General uh, Janet Mills put together a consortium 
And the consortium was a statewide effort to get people together and talk and issue a report. And the report came out in August of 2016. There were four different prongs that this report talked about. One was prevention, one was harm reduction, one was treatment, and one was law enforcement. So all of those different parts had a group of people from around the state who talked about it and came up with recommendations. So that report was issued in, in 2016. By this time, the governor had backed off from the whole thing and disavowed himself from, from this consortium. But were you a part of that? Okay, so you were the law enforcement yeah. arm? Okay, great. So from that, um, there, there were legislative efforts um, and bills that came forward. Um, and another group, the Opiate Task Force, which is a group of legislators who talked about and had um, public hearings about the opiate epidemic in an effort to get legislation together that we could move forward. And um, so I generated some of that legislation. Other people generated some of it. It all went through what we call the sausage machine, public hearings and, and uh, efforts came to the floor, went to the Senate, um, went to the governor. He vetoed it. It would come back to the, the House and Senate. We tried to get an override. Some we did, some we didn't. A lot of, some of that legislation, some very important legislation is now caught in what I'm saying is limbo. Um, that is that um, uh, three weeks ago um, we, uh, we um, adjourned, but there is legislative um, work that is very important that still needs to be done. Um, part of these bills were, are held in that limbo. I'm very hopeful, and in fact, if we don't come back for a special, here, special session, I will be devastated because a lot of the work that I have really worked hard on um, the past two years will just fall off a cliff. And, um, and, it, and it, it, it's being held hostage for two reasons. One is the Republicans don't want Med Medicaid expansion, and they don't want a minimum wage increase. And so all the other bills are being held held in, um, in, in, uh, as hostage for those two issues. So there are active negotiations now. I understand from uh, conversations yesterday that um, the Speaker of the House and the, and the, um, the Senate um, min Minority Leader, Troy Jackson and, um, or Sarah Gideon and Troy Jackson respectively, were seen walking into the governor's office. And that um, we're there waiting for some, you know, white smoke to come out of the chimney or something. So, um, so it's a very frustrating place to be right now. Um, but I wanted to give you a sense of the things that have come forward with this. And I'll also say that because of my work in the opiate um, world and my, and, uh, because I'm a physician and a neurologist, and this is all brain-based work, um, I was asked to be an opiate policy fellow for the United States. Um, and so I represent Maine along with 25 other legislators who have equally um, broad base and broad knowledge. We meet, um, we met in, Wa in Washington, um, no, New Orleans. Um, uh, for the first time we're going to all meeting in uh, Colorado to talk about successes and how we're moving things along. And so it's a very good group and I am proud to bring my, uh, my um, understanding to this group and bring back to Maine the work that other states have done. It also has given me access to our um, experts uh, in this group at the NCSL, National Conference of State Legislators, um, to get easy access to inf information. So that, that's, um, uh, I think, a nice thing for Maine. Um, so um, things, I'm gonna, just going to tell you about some uh, legislation that we're circling around. And if you have questions about them, let me know which ones interest you. So <clears throat> the prevention part, um, I think we all see that um, prevention means a healthy community. And healthy community means good education, a good start in life. Um, so Head Start programs, increasing education funding, work around neonatal abstinence syndrome, um, work around ACEs, the adverse childhood um, events that little kids can go through and it scars them for life and their brains develop um, differently and heroin is the perfect, the perfect drug for them because it cures them until it doesn't. 
Um, so child abuse, um, we're working hard on the child abuse. You might have heard about those two kids who were killed um, by their parents. Um, there's a lot of effort around the child abuse efforts. Um, poverty support to decrease stress. Jobs, 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 jobs. Behavioral and evidence-based programs for behavioral health. Um, uh, the things in prevention that don't work are hiring somebody to come talk to an auditorium full, full of kids and having them tell their story, their program. None of those things have really been evidence-based, effective work. So you have to be careful with prevention. Um, um, building goals and resilience uh, through program designed for the community. And then telling communities loud and clear, this is your problem. And you know your community and you know what your resources is, are, so get everyone together. You know, when we have public hearings and we have a bill that comes in front of us, I say to people, look at everyone in the room. You, you know, don't look to us for legislative solutions because those are minute. You have the power to change your community. So we're going to take a break now. You go out in the hallway, have some conversations, work on your relationships, and figure out how you're going to make your communities healthy. Because you gave us a problem. You gave us a bill that had a solution. The solution's not really right, but we still have the problem. So let's you know figure it out. So prevention, harm reduction. Um, Decreasing the stigma language, um, we had a bill that changed all of our statutes to person-centered language. Um, so you know how you have uh, your um, your computer program, and you can say you know look scan all the words and change this to that or whatever. Well, that's what they did for all the whole sta all the statute books for the laws, and they changed um, the words to person-centered language. The ones we couldn't figure out were. Um, the uh, SAMS, the substance abuse um, uh, and mental health uh, department, which is a state and a federal organization, but you can't change that because that's how, what it's called. So we had to leave that alone. Anyway, um, harm reduction, Narcan, you, you probably read about the governor's, um, that was a real haul. It should not have been a real haul. Every step of the way, we had to introduce a bill, we had to override the bill, the veto, we had to bring it back. It should not have been that hard, but we've settled everything. You can get it in the pharmacy now. Um, anyway, you can ask me about that if you're interested. Safe injection sites, we have a $75,000 $75, bill that's held up in limbo to expand our, injection, our, our needle exchange I'm sorry, needle exchange programs I'm talking about. Um, needle exchange programs. Um, you know, HIV, we talked about that. HIV, um, uh, hepatitis C uh, virus, um, $85,000 per person per cure, right? Um, endocarditis and sepsis are the big medical problems um, to prevent. And there is a number value um, we talked about. Um, if you have a needle exchange, um, what you're preventing. So there's real dollars that you save if that's what you're interested in. If you're interested in only that, there's a really good um, argument to be made. And some people are interested only in that. Um, safe injection sites um, was an interesting, it was a bill that came through. Um, so uh, Toronto now has four of them. I was just interviewed for um, the Fox affiliate in uh, Maine because the Fox affiliate in Maine had de developed a, a, a segment on safe injection sites and the reporter um, went to Toronto and visited all of them and she um, talked to me because I, I, I ran the hearing for the bill and she talked to the sponsor, um, Mike Sylvester from Portland. and. Um, and uh, I was like, she was really supportive, and I thought, oh, Fox affiliate, you know, safe injection site. She said, well, I'll tell you when it's going to air, and I never heard from her. So I have a feeling it's hung up somewhere, and then, you know, her editor might have, or whoever it is, producer, said, what, well, you know. Um, but, um, but just to know that that's 
moving along somehow, the, the conversation is moving along. And, and I gave a floor speech about it um, because I personally endorse the idea as for harm reduction. But I know as a representative, my people I represent, my constituents, would not endorse it because the, the conversation just hasn't happened enough. So that, that's what I said in my floor speech. I'm voting no, but I, I personally believe in this, but I know as a representative, my constituents wouldn't. So I'm happy to move the conversation along. All right, so that's harm reduction treatment. Um, uh, we have a hub and spoke program, $12 million, all ready to go. The structure's there, everything's built, it's in that limbo. Um, hub and spoke mean, is a MAT program, medication assisted treatment, um, with a hub and spokes. So the hub, when people are actively um, using and they're in the life, you know, I used to hear this when I was in New York and Boston. I can't, I can't let go of the life. You know, and, and that's, you know, my friends, the people who are going to help me inject. Where am I going to get my next dose? I mean, everybody's involved in it. Um, so um, they're very sick. They're really, you know, they're sick. They're sick physiologically, sick mentally, um, and so they take a lot of um, of manpower um, if they come into treatment, and so. The hub is where intensive outpatient treatment happens and where people can be seen every day and be sick in the, emerge, in, the, in the waiting room. Because a lot of people, a lot of providers, don't want a sick person with a substance use disorder to be sitting next to you know, someone with diabetes who's there for their control because it changes the nature of the waiting room. So, um, so the hub is this place where this is acceptable behavior in order to transform a person, help them along their journey. Um, the spoke is where they can go and sit in the waiting room. So they, they, they are healthy enough that they're on something, Vivitrol, Suboxone, abstinence, um, good support, peer support, whatever, whatever it is that's working for them, um, and then they go to the the, the spoke. And then when they get sick again or they relapse, because relapse is part of the disease, they can go back to the hub. So this is the hub and spoke model that's been successful in Vermont and has really, uh, really decreased their numbers. Um, uh, we need more Suboxone providers. We've increased um, prescribing to physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, um, increase the number on the panel. That's a federal law that, that um, people can only treat 20, now they can treat up to 100 um, providers who can provide Suboxone. You have to go to an eight hour, um, I'm getting into the weeds, ask me about that. Peer, peer recovery, again, really, really important. Um, immediate triage is really important, um, we're not there yet. Jails, 80 to 90 percent, people come in. Um, have some substance use disorder or it's drug fueled. <coughs> There's a great Vivitrol program that goes from the jails to Families First. We don't have that because we don't have Medicaid expansion. Um, so the treatment part. It, another interesting thing, I got to tell you, I, um, I, I worked on the medical cannabis law. I was on the subcommittee um, to uh, rework the law and I'm really proud of the work we did it was tough we worked for a good four months um, with, and I um, I said it was okay for people to start talking about using cannabis to treat substance use disorder um, and so the law that is in limbo now that we need to pass um, changes the engagement of providers so that that is possible. You can ask me about that if you're interested. Um, law enforcement was the other part. I think you heard a lot from um, Sheriff. So um, other bills that are, that are stuck are the Macaulay House is a um, uh, um, house run by Mercy Hospital in Portland. It's for women who have kids who are, have substance use disorder and it's a home. You heard about how important housing is. 
where people get intensive treatment and treatment to be parents. How, how, how do you be a parent while you're going through this? So um, that program is going to be, we have funds to replicate that program. Um, I think three replications, or two replications, one in a, in a rural place, one in an urban place. Um, it was called the House Bill, H-O-U-S-E, I forget the acronym. Um, what it stands for, but it's about housing for homeless um, people with drug use disorder and homelessness. I think that was um, vetoed, and I don't think the veto was overwritten. But it'll come back. It's all written um, when we get a new governor. Um, needle exchange, I told you about 75,000. Um, child abuse, poverty support, told you about that. We have bills around that, the hub and spoke. Um, we have a substance use disorder cabinet, um, which is my bill, to form a, a cabinet at the, the governor's office to be responsible for all these efforts. Because um, logistically, if you have a program that um, it, it reaches into everything, it's not just health and human services, it's not just education, it's not just law enforcement or public safety. You have to be able to reach in and you have to be able to share financial resources. So this is a bill that creates that capacity um, so that people aren't siloed. And what I've seen is that um, people work in silos and they don't cross because their funding doesn't allow them to cross. So HHS gets a uh, SAMHSA substance uh, da, 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 um, grant from the federal government, and they can only use it in their silo. Um, so this is a bill that allows that money to be um, spent through cross silos. Um, so I'm happy to, to take, I think all of us are, uh, questions um, about any of this. Yeah, I would say, as we, if you have questions, that I'll ask whoever the question is directed to, please repeat the question just so we can pick it up on audio. So, no. I, I don't even know who this question is for. Maybe Gary or maybe the sheriff, but when somebody is uh, found with an overdose and presumably they end up at the hospital, where, what happens to them next? Where, where, do, they, where do they go? Well, I can respond. Could you repeat that, Bill? No, just, uh, oh, okay. When somebody's found with an overdose, or when somebody overdoses and they're transported to the hospital, what happens next? Well, I, unfortunately, we, a lot of police funds don't have the resources to follow up. And that's a very insightful question that you just asked. Because in, um, in a domestic violence case, and it's, it's found to be very, very successful. If we get a call and there's a domestic violence case, we typically will follow up with the family or the, the victim and say, is everything okay? And that's really instrumental so that the victim doesn't feel like they're left alone. And unfortunately, we don't do that when somebody overdoses and um, they're transported to the hospital and that's usually the last contact that they have. Uh, and it would be really important uh, that we did follow up because that's a near death experience for them and perhaps that might be the turning point but um, somebody gets uh, somebody found overdosed and they get hit with Narcan and they're transported to the uh, to the hospital and sometimes oftentimes that's the last time they see the first responder and they're not always transported so they wake up they won't go and so there are states I heard this at the opiate um, fellows fellowship that give a partial dose of, of Narcan just to wake people up partially so they have to be transported to the emergency room. And once they're there, that, that, then you have to have capacity for peer support, which is really important to have a peer support person, and, um, and treatment options, which we don't have. You know, we don't have that immediacy, but that's what, you know, what, what some states have done. Um, and so when people get to the hospital, even if they get there, there has to be something for them to plug into, not a card that says, you know, call this number in three weeks, you'll, you, you, may, you may get somewhere. But, you know, the peer support thing, right, on site, and, uh, and treatment options uh, are really important. We don't have that. Just to follow up on Lynn's question, uh, what is the protocol or policy, at least to the New York uh, County Sheriff's Office, on arrests or charges 
following uh, a report of an overdose, either among the people that might have reported it, or you know, you walk in and there's a bag there, you already know that there's, that there's pills all over the place. What is the protocol or the usual MO? Well, um, what is the protocol when somebody overdoses? Somebody like overdoses. Good Samaritan. They, so this is the Good Samaritan law, or, which we don't have in Maine. Or they call it. It was. It was. It was. Um, it was overturned. Okay. No. No Good Samaritan law. Somebody calls in an overdose in a house in Kittery. You show up there, or the local police show up there. Is there a protocol on all the people in there not getting arrested, or what? Well. Well. What's the protocol when we show up to an overdose? And, treatment um, first, obviously. Yeah, it, it is. It's, okay. it's treatment first. But the, the protocol is, is that we call MDEA, the Maine Drug Enforcement Administration, and they'll come down and while we're there, we'll, we'll speak to the other people that are, that are present to try to determine what's the source of the heroin uh, or, or fentanyl, you know, you know, who the people are, and just try to positively identify everybody. But typically, uh, MDEA, that's their valley with, uh, and um, they'll come down and, and they'll do an investigation. Most states have a Good Samaritan law. A lot do now. We, we hopefully, we will eventually. And that would be uh, if somebody was using in a house and there were multiple people and somebody called and uh, ambulance got there and there was evidence of paraphernalia and evidence of people around who were also using, those people would have clemency. They wouldn't be arrested. That, that's the Good Samaritan Law. But that doesn't exist that doesn't in exist Maine, now. so I'm trying to so figure out how often do arrests come from mm -hmm. calls about overdoses in Maine or in York County. I would say very rarely. Very rarely, okay. Do they have Samar Good Samaritan in New Hampshire? Yeah, so we passed it in, in New Hampshire, and I served on the Narcan Study Commission, a legislative commission. And one of the one of the fee, one of the things that came up was actually police advocating for it in the state because they would get a call, found find someone outside wet on the doorstep. Um, so they would try to revive or try to throw cold water or you know try to get them to wake up that way and then they'd get them out of their house so that they weren't arrested. And so it was actually a police-led push for our changes. It, Patty, is this, in, is this in limbo in Maine, or no. has it been defeated? No, it was defeated, but it'll okay. come back next session. All right. Um, so something Patty said I think is really important on the, okay. on the first question. Um, and, and I tell you, what, Mark, please come up for a second. I'm going to just capture it. I just want to have you come up. Uh, uh, Mark Lefebvre, come on. No, please come up. I just want to, <laughs> no, to catch this on camera. Mark is oh. uh, over, of course, within the recovery. I'm one uh, of the founders program. of Safe Harbor Recovery Center. Oh, and I'm also, um, I'm a founder of uh, Heroin Anonymous Media in Seabrook, New Hampshire. And I've got a private practice now as a recovery coach. And I'm doing some strategy work. Um, I think you picked a fine panel. Um, I identify with something that every one of them had, had to share today. Um, before I get to my follow-up, though, um, I introduced myself to Sheriff um, King. Um, I met yesterday with Chief Bob McKenzie from um, Kennebunk, and I've met with him a few times, and we're coming up with some alternatives to bring recovery assets to York County, and uh, either in the form of brick and mortar or possibly something that's more of a mobile, um, mobile um, um, force that would be able to bring treatment and recovery out to the rural communities that are so prevalent here in Maine. Um, so stay tuned for that. If you see something like that, show up in the newspaper. Make sure you write the letters to the editor and to support that because we have difficulty reaching Chapley and Acton and you know all these other places that are um, far away. Um, but um, sorry, Patty mentioned peer recovery services in the emergency room. In New Hampshire, at, uh, at Portsmouth Hospital, Frisbee, Wentworth Douglas, and in Massachusetts, all the Leahy hospitals, Ianna Jakes and Newport, they all have pre peer recovery coaches on call. You have to live within 45 minutes of the hospital to qualify and get certified as a recovery coach and essentially perform that function so that somebody's not being treated and just released back out into the parking lot of the hospital. They can, um, they can opt to have somebody come in and talk with them. Um, maybe hook them up with a volunteer to get them to a 12-step or some other meeting, um, you know, get them uh, to a caseworker perhaps where they can look at treatment options and so forth. So I think that would be a really, really good thing for me. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Paula. Well, I, I'm a neophyte here. So Narcan 
only works with opioid overdose. So like if somebody consumed too much alcohol or no. some other thing, it's only yeah. opioid. Right. Yeah. And there's um, no toxicity at all. Zero. Even a kid, a baby, if you give baby Narcan, there's no toxicity. Which is mm -hmm. remarkable. Yeah. I really want to thank you, Katie. For your story, and I hope it. I hope it's captured. I, I know people that would love to watch that. Thank you very much for your story. Sarah, next to housing, um, one of the things that I understand is extremely important is supporting the recovering person in the work environment. And I had the opportunity to hear Dave Mara, who is the drug czar. They call him in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he said was to have training sessions in the work environment to explain to people who are employees without pointing out, pointing any fingers. Tell employees what it means to be addicted and what it means to go through the recovery process so that they really understand and appreciate the difficulty that people are facing and are not so quick to be judgmental. Is there anything like that going on in the state of Maine? No, I didn't ask her to tell me ask this question. <laughs> 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 but on, June, on June 7th, we're having a recovery workforce job fair at the Pepperell Mill campus in Bennett. And what, what, what we've done is we've, we've got uh, many businesses that are friendly to meet people in recovery. Yeah. And um, we've got um, we've got a well, while people go there, I mean we're trying to take take care of all all of the barriers. There's a hair salon at the Pepper Mill campus that's willing to give haircuts or or trim up somebody's hair. We're going to have a clothes closet. Um, actually from the jail we're going to do a video link for people that are getting out that, that they can apply to different the businesses that are there. Um, we, we had such, we're having a good response. We're also, um, it's, a, it's a collaboration between the York County Sheriff's Office, Representative Marty Groman is very involved in it, and ENSO Recovery Services from uh, Cumberland County and York County. So we're, we're try, trying to address that, and it, it, it's really very exciting because a lot of the businesses are, you know, emailing me and they're asking questions, well, what is this? I, and I explain what it is, and everybody's needing skilled or, or you know, or unskilled or semi-skilled workers, and this is a great workforce, but oftentimes when somebody goes in and they do a resume or a, or a job application, it's there's gaps in employment, and that's a huge red flag, and then people are embarrassed to say, well, I was in recovery, or I was in a hospital, or what have you, and this takes that right off the table. Now people can say, everybody knows, well, these people are in recovery, so it's going to be gaps in employment. And we go in with that transparency, and now it's just people talking to employers. And the employers or the human resources offices don't need to share that information with the would-be colleagues of this person, or of these people. And the initiative you described, which Governor Sununu was a, it has put out to other states, so I think at last count there's five states that have signed on. So Maine could sign on and join that initiative as well. Um, and what it does is it's providing training and support around recovery friendly workplaces. Um, so if that's of interest. So it's a program. I mean it has a name. It's a program and I'm, I'm not sure if others know even more about it but it's, it's recovery friendly workplace. The companies get credit for being one. They, they get to carry the flag on their website that says they are such and such. They get tax incentives and they have uh, resources that are available to come in and work with HR to provide training and assistance to people um, who are making that transition safe from incarceration into the workforce. It's a great idea. I have a, kind of a naive question, and I guess this, anybody here on the panel might be able to answer it. Um, I currently have a patient in the hospital. Uh, heroin uh, had been clean for a long time, has just started again in the past eight months, and right now has been hospitalized for maybe the past six weeks, showered with septic emboli, his pulmonary cavities are filling up with pus, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And a smart guy in, you know, has been in and out of that community for a long time, but 
when I spoke to him, like, I think three days ago, he said, I had no idea that this kind of thing, of the infection and all that, could ever happen. And, and I guess, um, I'm sure that, you know, the communities and the, and the people who are using are far from, you know, people who kind of study this stuff, but is there any means of, of getting that word out? I mean, do, are, are people out in the streets having any awareness of, you know, what's at risk, or is it just totally negated by the desire to... Yeah. Yeah. So we do a lot of outreach on specific topics like that. So um, I capitalize on free labor of nursing students to create resources. They have projects. Um, but one of the resources we created was on infection risk and skin infections. Um, but part of what where harm reduction approaches come in is really meeting people where they're at with resources as well. And so what they came up with is which was originally a really clinic-level brochure that would sit on a wall somewhere and never get read. Um, working with people who were using on it became something that was expletive-filled but yeah. connected people. Yeah. It engaged them. They looked at it, they were like, cool, this is different. Yeah. Um, and so we do sort of little campaigns through syringe service on different overdose prevention, on skin infection prevention, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think, yeah, I wasn't suggesting that somebody say, oh, if I get a bad infection, then they're out of I'm not going to use. But it, it was that. I mean, I, I was just stunned that a, a smart guy had never heard of this, and he's been involved for upwards of 20 years. I, okay. I'm sorry. Can, can I share a story? And, and that's, that's why the recovery coaches and your supporters so, so important. Um, last summer in Arundel, we had a horrendous night. I mean, there was a lot of things going on and, and um, in, in our patrol area, and I listened to the radio, and I said, my goodness, I mean, the guys were just out straight, going here, going there, and we had a, an overdose in Arundel. I live in Soho, so I was pretty close, and I knew that they were trying to pull people in, so I said, you know, let me look and see what I can do to help. So I went there, and I, you know, they, they were there, and they were talking, and it was a, uh, a guy from New York that just came up, and he came up to go to Old Orchard Beach and to party a bit. And he was with a friend of his. They were young, a couple of young guys. And the sergeant said, look, Sarah, thanks for coming out, but I don't have anybody at the hospital. So I said, let me go to the hospital. I went down to Southern Maine Healthcare. And, um, and the, his friend said, gee, can I go with you? I said, well, yeah, you know, come on. And on the way, I talked to him. He said, oh, my God, I'm telling you, this is, you know, we don't use heroin. I mean, I don't know where he got it. And, and he told me all this stuff. I said, come on, don't, don't, you know, don't say this. And I said, tell me the truth. And uh, he said, I'm telling you, I, I don't use it. And I don't know where this guy, it must have been a flu. So we went there, and of course the doctors would talk to me, and he said, the kid, the kid just passed. I said, oh, oh. God, yeah. So I said, well, we've got to get the, you know, is there a wallet on? Because we need to find an extra can. And I called the sergeant and told him what had happened. And they, he was interviewing the people at the house that he was visiting. So I went out, and I... You know, and I was, I was busy, obviously, and I said to the kid, I said, I, I, you know, we haven't told his parents yet, you know, but the kid was like 26, I said, so I, I said, he said, what's going on? I said, your, your friend, your friend passed, and I'm very sorry, and he wept, and he cried, and, you know, and, and he was my son's age, so, you know, I, mean, I felt bad for the kid, he's there, and, 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 is there anybody I can call? He goes, no, 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 no. So anyway, we had a very nice chat, I said, let's go get a coffee, and I took him back to the thing, I, to the to the house he was staying at. Three hours later, they called me. He overdosed. Oh my God. Oh God. The power of addiction is just incredible. It's just incredible. And, uh, you know. It's the perfect drug for, for treating whatever. I used to ask people, you know, when I was, in the, I was an intern and a resident, you know, so I had all the time in the world on the ward. And I would ask people, you know, who are cocaine, heroin, you know, methamphetamine, you know, why did you choose, why is this your drug? Why is this like your friend? Because that's what it was, it was like their, their best friend. Why did you choose this? And they would tell me, you know, that drug didn't do this, this one didn't do that, this was the one, you know, this is like, it made me feel right, like you were saying, you know, it made me feel <coughs> human, it got rid of that stuff, that other thing I've been dealing with, and it's just, it's just the right thing for me. So they don't care. You know, people would have two valve replacements for their endocarditis and go out and continue to use. You know, 
there are articles in the medical literature now about you know how many valve replacements are enough before you say I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, you know, then the docs have to stand there and watch somebody die because they're not getting another valve replacement. It's just, you know, it's, it's just, it's so compelling. It just, for the right person, it's the perfect answer. Until it isn't. You see Until people, it isn't. You see people smoking through uh, tracheotomy. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 I mean, in yeah. my yeah. case, my addiction was more powerful and important to me than my family. And I think I, uh, with that and with medical procedures, I always go back to parity with medical care. I mean, we do amputation after amputation on people who are obese, diabetic, with high blood pressure that aren't taking care of themselves. And so I don't believe that we should make restrictions around that unless we restrict all behaviors that are or uh, conditions associated with our personal behavior that could yeah. be managed. But it tells me that, that our treatment options are not there, that that person is continuing to do that um, instead of somehow intensively being treated with evidence-based protocols and evidence-based medicine in the way that they need to, meeting them where they are. Um, you know, it, it just, that's the fail. Narcan is a failure of treatment to me. You know, people should should be treated before they they pass out and die. There should have been some intervention, something along the way that that got them to some other place besides being woken up from death. Susan? Yeah, is there, are, is there any special programming in Maine or New Hampshire funded by the government um, that's aimed specifically at pregnant mm -hmm. users and postpartum users? So the question is, are there any programs Aimed at pregnant users. The treatment, the, 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 the programs are, are, are aimed at, at um, the neonatal abstinence syndrome and protecting the child and therefore, you know, wrapping the service around the, the parent. So, um, so that's, that's where, like, this Macaulay House um, is oh, set up. Hmm? Hope on Haven Hill, Hope on Haven which is Hill. founded by Kittery's very own Terry Norman. Yep, right, right. Um, so th those types of programs, which wrap around services with the child, the infant, and the mother, it's usually you know, mm -hmm. usually single parent, usually the mother, usually mother and newborn. Um, we had an attempt at. Um, well, we've got to work through it. You know, a lot of bills come forward, and they're the problems identified, the solution's not the right solution. Yeah. So this was about how to get birth control for people who deliver. And um, so we kind of worked through it with Medicaid and, and Maine Care, and um, uh, up until the end where some money was going to go to Planned Parenthood, and that, like, blew it all up. So, um, uh, so it's the wraparound programs. Um, there's a program called Cradle Me, um, which is um, uh, uh, people, we've had, we've had a real issue with public health nurses. You might have read about um, the governor fired all our public health nurses. There was an, F, uh, an attempt to bring them all back. We brought back a lot, but they haven't been, the, the, um, the positions haven't been publicized, and the people who have reported to be part of it, have been told, no, we don't want you. So there's still this fight about public health nurses, because in a lot of other states, that's where the effort comes from, right? Um, and they organize it. So um, we do have this cuddle, Cradle Me program where there's home visits, but they're not public health nurses. They're people who are given a check sheet, you know, like, how does this look? How does everything look? And their eyes aren't as good as public health nurses. Um, so we're, we're trying. There's some great programs that are kind of one-off or, you know, being developed. But one in New Hampshire that's really looking to publish on all the work they've been doing is through CMC, uh, Catholic Medical Center in Manchester. In their roots program, um, it follows people through and then postpartum, alumni, and a connection throughout. Um, and so, so much of it is that the need is so great. and different programs have developed and now we're looking at all the evidence to say like, okay, which is the program we need to make sure is in every hospital that every person has access to. 
Um, but often what you find is that when, once people hear about compassionate care, they come from two hours away to that program or to another program that they've heard has a good reputation. So it doesn't, you know, even having one program is a huge public health benefit. Yes, please. I have more of a, a, um, a statement than a question. And my experience is 30 years old. I mean, things may have changed, but I've been cleaning so for over 30 years. And my doctors had all the evidence in the world that I had a drug and alcohol problem and, and made excuses for me. Like, mm -hmm. you know, didn't, or, I think we're uncomfortable. I used to do that. Still. As a physician. <coughs> it's un really uncomfortable. I would have liked you. I would have, you know. Uncomfortable. But, right. She's you know, the social worker right. here, and yeah, she looks yeah. good. And right. this is not alcoholic gastritis. Right? It's, it's you're worried about something. So when there are opportunities for someone to have a, a conversation with me, those didn't happen because of their discomfort with the disease process. And I think we're still a little bit uncomfortable with it. So I would say we need everything that you're saying. But maybe some of you here have a friend or relative, and you're concerned about their drinking or or their drugging. Have you said to them, are you having a problem with alcohol? Because in the end, for me, it was a friend of mine who had the courage to call me on the phone and say, are you having a problem with alcohol? Mm -hmm. And that's what I needed. And I'm not saying everybody needs that, but if you're a caring friend and you suspect that in somebody, it's not going to hurt them, I don't think. Mm -hmm. that's that's good good. Good. And you mentioned the word alcohol because I think we're forgetting about alcohol. And I and I uh, I just I voted no to expand our uh, Port Portland uh, uh, alcohol uh, sale uh, stores where they were going to increase it by one. <laughs> and I voted no, and everyone like turned and looked. At, you know, <laughs> why did you put your red light? Like you must have made a mistake. And I, so I gave a speech about it. You know that we're forgetting about alcohol and what. You know, around here, every other um, gas station is now an alcohol, you know, sells alcohol. Hannaford, you walk in there and the caps of every, you know, what alcohol to eat with your fish, what alcohol to eat with your, your Cheerios, you know, it's like, it's crazy. I was there the day you said that, and I really appreciated you saying that, but like you said, Get out of here first, because when I'm walking around the corner and there's an end cap or Rite Aid, Rite Aid has this thing when you go up to the um, mm -hmm. cashier and it's like the summer thing, mm -hmm. and it's these pink drinks and blue drinks, and you know, I'm waiting in line to get gum, and all of a sudden it's right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Kathy, did you go? Uh, just a couple of quick questions. One, Carrie, briefly. Uh, what, do you know what happened to your middle school friend? Yeah, she's still one of my, she, is the only one in that family that's never had a problem. Huh. She's got a couple kids, she's getting married soon. So she didn't go your route in high school. Yeah, and that's why I think that it's not really, uh, I, I just, I don't believe that like, it is something that's passed down from like family member to family member. Good. None of my family, I mean maybe my grandmother's brother I think died of like, something that has to do with his liver, but I never really knew that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's just something that's in you, you know, whether you're born with it or not. I mean, everyone has their own opinion, but yeah, she's fine. I have, I have a lot of friends who, like, both of their parents were drug addicts and alcoholics, and, like, they, they turned out fine, you know, and then my mom and dad, like, it's nothing, you know, like, yeah, yeah. my mom has, like, a glass of wine and, like, starts to feel it and, like, Leaves it there. I'm like, you paid for that. Like, really? Like, you have a glass of wine? You know? The, the other question was um, Carrie may notice here. Wasn't there a country where heroin was legal and ca uh, very carefully it's controlled in, in England? Yeah. 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 So, um, uh, kind of the harm reduction center is the Netherlands. Yeah. Netherlands? So well, I know for, our, but I didn't know for heroin. And, and so, prescription heroin has been implemented in Vancouver, um, in Canada, mm -hmm. with good success recently. Um, but there's all different strategies, and again, for all different, you know, all different types. It doesn't mean that that's the solution for everyone, but. When we're, if, if our goal is to save money and save lives, it's a great option. Mom. Yeah. Um, when we were talking about alcohol, I was sort of segueing into marijuana and just wondering to what extent 
recreational and medical marijuana impacts the whole cycle? We'll find out. I have an opinion on that that's very different than marijuana was the drug that I hated the most because it messed me up the most. I would smoke marijuana and be so paranoid and like couldn't even function or do anything. It was, I, I hate marijuana, it's awful. But that's just people say like, oh, is it a gateway? I'm like, I don't know. I feel like if marijuana was a gateway drug, I would have just been like, I'm not doing drugs ever again. Yeah, because it was like the worst feeling in the world. I don't know. I, I hate that feeling. So? Well, did you have a question? I just had a question. Is there any movement towards funding in your state to alternative treatments to drug addiction? Is seeing that the medical industry really doesn't have a solution? Like, is there ever going to be a funding or an angel program or whatever you would call it where you could open something up that is a non-medical facility that helps either solely men in recovery in a house or solely women? That's the Macaulay House. That's is there funding? Up. Yes, yeah, okay. yeah. It's, okay. it's held up in limbo now, but hopefully oh, yeah. that'll, um, that'll be solved. Because, I mean, I hear a lot of people complain about Big Pharma, you know. I heard you guys speaking on those lawsuits. But when we really sit down and think about MAT programs, what are we doing? We're just lying in the pockets of Big Pharma again because now we're giving them suboxone and methadone. And if you look at the relapse rate on suboxone and methadone, it's very, very high. Very, very high. Yeah, I'll, I'll and then I remember I drive through Lynn for work and there's a methadone program and it's filled with moms and carriages. Wow. What does that baby have for a chance? So there's got to be some type of in-between where somebody finally says, okay, the medical treatment really isn't focusing on the disease. Like there's a disease model that most doctors don't know about it, but an alcoholic and a drug addict understands it because we've been through it. So when I got help from a drug addict and an alcoholic, I had relapsed 10 to 15 times on Suboxone and Methadone. I've done that programs. There's a fine line between who is a true drug addict and who's a heavy user. Mm -hmm. MAT will work for a heavy user, but what are we doing about those people that are, like me, a core drug addict, alcoholic? Like that's well, where I get lost. What's your suggestion? What's your, what, you know, where There's only one thing that I know that's worked for me, and I've tried everything. I've been evaluated for teams of psychiatrists. I probably have upwards of 100 friends that are sober through the way we went through from the 1930s, which just, it's church and state, so they won't really fund it, unfortunately. Uh, there's a house that I volunteer my time at. We have 28 people that have gone through there in the past year. It's been open, only two have relapsed. And what is that? It's what, a non medical what? facility, no drugs at all, no treatment. Right. It's going through the step process. Step, 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 step process. Step process is bigger and vigorous and honest from the 1930s. Yeah, step housing, peer support. Um, no, faith based. Faith based. A peer is never well, going to keep me from getting high. But your faith is your peer, you know, so that's well, a. You know, it's a well, I was given a few of, yeah, exactly 100%, yeah. exactly. But I was given the tools to combat my drug and alcohol disease without medication. Yeah. See, here's my big issue that I just have a question because you've been a doctor, right? So, we take the person from detox, mm -hmm. we they're, they're all hopped off, right? And then they're all hopped up on all the meds to go off of whether it's and use this or that. Now, we're putting them into a program that's medically assisted. Mm -hmm. How do we know who that person is? And how can we diagnose that person until we see them abstinent for 20 to 30 days? Yeah, I, I get so lost. You know, in there's, a, there's a toolbox of treatment. And some people, you know, but a very small group of people will go through abstinence based programs, faith based programs, and really come back on the other side and continue their sobriety. Yeah, no, in the 1930s, there's millions. Well, I will only tell you my experience, which is in Maine, there's a faith-based program, and they came to the state house, and I had lunch with the people who were there. And, I, and they were very honest about their numbers. And their numbers were terrible. But they felt good that at the end, those three people who were still sober, they felt really had a lot of pride in those three. And those three who were there talking about you know, their journey had a lot of pride in themselves yeah. and were really wrapped into it. So, so that, for them, that worked. It's like the Macaulay House, um, which is faith-based, although you can be on treatment. 
So it's for mothers with kids. And, um, and there are rules. I mean, there are real rules. And if you break the rules, you're kicked out. Yeah, one and done. One and done. And, and so <laughs> what it does is the people who, who graduate, who come out, great, you know, good. There's a small group who came out. But there are, what do you do with the people who were kicked out? You know, those are people maybe without the resources or the, the understanding about faith or God or whatever helped them through. They, they fall somewhere else. So what do you do for those people? Um, and they maybe, you know, Suboxone is the place for them. Exactly. And, 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 and I agree with that. You know, Hobbes so spoke. I, I agree with that. So I guess I, I was just wondering, how do we get access to the funding to start a home that is the non-medical facility that helps men and women? You fight hard. That's what we did That's this not, session. We fight. We yeah. fought hard. It we didn't like get it's one. Just an uphill battle, you know? It's a, it's a it's battle. It just never goes like downhill. It, it is a on. battle. There's actually. Um, I'm, I'm on the board of directors of Journey House, and, and we have that type of program right now where we purchase house. We're, sorry, we're renting houses, and we have people addicts in, re, in recovery that we give them free rent. And, but, but after a month, we're, they, they, they have to stop looking they for a job, and, and then they, and then they, uh, and the typical stay is, what we envision is two years, but we have a house in Portland, we have a house in Sanford, um, Benefit House Burned Down, and, um, oh, yeah, and, yeah and, and we have uh, one in, uh, just opened up in Andrew, uh, Lewiston. It's awesome to hear so, yeah, how I mean, long it, their recovery time is to be there. And it, it's actually from, the, the, the founder is a, is a, um, is a, Former person that used, I want to use the correct terminology. Yeah. Well, say person in recovery. Well, it's like <laughs> person in recovery that uh, from New Hampshire. His name is Jesse Harvey. Dynamic individual. Awesome. So, yeah. That's awesome to hear. So, uh, let's fast forwarding you through. So, quick question, Sarah, and we'll call that a wrap. Well, okay. I, it's sort of more of a statement in a way because it's, it's like we've talked about the problem of addiction and how to address people and their fight and their battle to get off. Um, but totally unrelated to what we've mostly been talking about is how a lot of people have developed opioid addictions is through injuries and prescriptions, uh, which I think is interesting that that hasn't really been a topic tonight. <clears throat> but I have a cousin who is a retired pharmacist, and he told me that the, for the hospital to be accredited, they had to address pain management. And I found that shocking because if they weren't giving out enough drugs to reduce the pain, then they might not get funding. I'm like, what? Okay, so I went online to try to find out who are, who are these people who are doing the approvals, okay? And I understand, I believe, that there's a new approach now yeah. mm -hmm. so that that nastiness has been reduced. But I was also blown away by how many boards there are with approval and disapproval processes. And I wanted to verify my sense was that there's one particular committee, I guess they call it a committee, or governing board that handles wealth um, Medicaid and Medicare mostly now, in terms of hospitals being able to get approval or being approved. Um, can you? The Joint Commission. The Joint Commission. I guess that's what it is. And do you so think we, we that's did. a problem anymore in terms of keeping the pharma? I mean, to me, that was like the pharmaceuticals well. saying, "You get those people on drugs." Yeah, we but, want. but look, no. but really, look at you know um, pain. I, mean, I always used to say I wanted a pain o meter. You know, somebody comes in and they say, I have a 10 out of 10 pain. You can't, you don't really know that. I mean, the nurses, if they were, you know, they would come up to me and say, you know, I want 10, you know, 10 out of 10. She's sitting there reading, calling her, you know, <laughs> playing, whatever. That's not 10 out of 10. So, you know, we'd start to look at the behavior. But in outpatient, it's really hard. So it's called a fifth vital sign, you know, that you had to somehow manage it. There were these smiley face. Um, you know, zero to ten. Ten was this like crabby face that was ten, and the person would point to the one to ten um, face to show uh, how much pain they had, and then he had to treat it. So the person would say, "Yes, my pain is all better now." 
And then there are these Press Ganey scores. So there's, a, there's this company called Press Ganey. And when you get home from the hospital, they send you this um, survey. And the survey says, you know, how is your pain treated? And you can say, you know, terrible. And that, then the Press Ganey score will be terrible. And then it'll be published in LeapFrog, which is this um, online hospital evaluation um, where, and you will look online to see, should I go to Portsmouth Hospital? Oh no, their LeapFrog score is six, you know, because people were saying their pain wasn't treated well. So it was a whole, you know, whole, this whole thing, um, which is, which is being um, taken apart now, but it's still not gone. Can I just make one quick comment? I broke my leg a couple of years ago, and I was, and I had seen a 60 Minutes thing about how sports injuries lead to addiction. And I was really surprised all during, that, that no one talked to me. They, I got a lot of prescriptions. I need a drug try. I do have a whole thing. I shouldn't tell you where I live. I do have I, this whole, but no one ever talked to me about watch your pain medicine and start tapering off. It, what they do is, do you need more prescriptions? I'll bet that's changed. It is. I mean, with the prescriptions, having said that, the food for thought, the United States has, yeah, okay. the United States is 4% of the world's population. We consume 88% of the opioids. Yeah. 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 But now when we write a prescription, at least in New Hampshire, um, you have to check the uh, prescription drug monitoring program, but you also have to present the patient a list of these 10 things, which are sort of the warning signs and things to do and not do. Yeah. That's so, good to know. That, that came out I know your many. hospital will note about that. Are so, there restrictions that remain that you can only do seven yeah. days? Yeah, so th this bill came out of my committee, and it, it was a big, it was the only time we worked in a bipartisan way with the governor, um, which showed me like how this government thing could really work if you had teams, people who were trying to negotiate, you know, back and forth instead of slamming the door and not opening the door. Um, but, uh, so the big, it was an omnibus bill, we have, it was the PMP bill, so prescription monitoring program, which is, you have to use that, right? Um, we had that, um, uh, 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 veterinar veterinarians. Um, using it too. That was a whole separate bill. We had to undo that language somewhat. It, it's been an interesting journey with that whole bill. Um, but there is a, a, uh, an acute seven days. You can't, and a chronic 30 days. And then you can't go above 100 um, morphine um, equivalents. Um, and because of that 100, um, the problem was chronic pain, right? So. There are a lot of people now who are on many more milligrams than 100 morphine equivalents. Um, and they got into this because we were allowing it. And I was writing prescriptions for more than 100, and they'd come back and say, it's left pain, okay, you know. My, the literature says you can have more, so here's more. So we couldn't just say everybody comes down to 100. So we built in um, exemptions. And this is the beauty of this of the main statute, I think is the beauty of it, because other states, I know this from my experience in this opiate policy fellowship, haven't dealt with this well. And so um, we have exemptions, and the exemption in Maine is called a um, palliative care exemption. Palliative care and, um, and chronic, chronic and severe illness exemption. And there's a definition that was written by the palliative care specialists and it acknowledges that chronic pain can be so um, overwhelming that it takes over your life and needs to be treated on its own. And so in order to get the exemption, the physician or the provider and the patient have to agree that they fall within this exemption. And then on the prescription, they write exemption E. I think it's E or C. And then they have to write the ICD-10 code. So the code is their diagnosis. And that way, um, the Department of Health and Human Services can monitor through the Department of Pharmacy why this exemption is being given. And if you know a prescriber is overdoing it with that prescri prescription, they can call them and say, you know, why are you doing this or what's happening? So it took us, after this law was passed, it took us probably a year working very strongly with the Maine Medical Association, who have been incredibly good partners. Um, 
uh, to get the word out that this exemption. So I was getting patients who would call, who are you, what are you doing? Who do you think you are? You're just a legislator. You're ruining my life. You know, da, 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 my physician won't give it to me. Da, da. Um, so we, we worked out a strong partnership with the medical association, and I don't, I don't get those phone calls anymore. Um, and I think, I think it's working that exemption for people who have chronic pain who need to be on more than 100 MMEs. But it also gives physicians that discussion. You know, I can't by law give you more than this. And so hope the hope is that you know it'll stop um, people from escalating their dosage and it will stop this whole you know use. So. Well, thank you everybody. Katie, Bill, Patty.